Thank you all for coming to another Climate Matters show, a hybrid between a press conference and a very serious talk TV program. My name is Stuart Scott. I'm the host today, and we're coming to you live from COP23 in Bonn, Germany. Here's the email address that you can contact me at if you have questions for our guests afterwards or for myself. Okay, today's guests I have with me, Professor Kevin Anderson. Kevin is with the Center for Environment and Development Studies in Uppsala University, Sweden. He's also Deputy Director of the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. Also with us, Dr. Hugh Hunt, who's with the Department of Engineering, the University of Cambridge, also the United Kingdom. These gentlemen know one another well. They have sparred over these subjects for years, and we always have very entertaining conversations. I say sparred because they have some differences of opinion. Today's show we're calling Quit the Loose Talk and Let's Get Serious. So let's start out by my asking you, Kevin, what's the loose talk? Well, as I see it, we've actually committed very clearly in Paris to what we need to deliver at the global level. So we've, we've committed to reduce emissions in line with delivering two degrees centigrade, not with a, uh, um, just a, as, as if it's a target or a, a goal, but actually as it's a commitment, a duty, an obligation. But yet when we actually talk to people, whether it's the policymakers or some of the social scientists or indeed some of the engineers and scientists involved, they, they talk about it in a way that, so an engineer might talk about, oh, we can solve it all with nuclear power. And you say, well, what do you mean by it? Well, climate change. Well, what do you mean by climate change? And they've never actually thought to quantify this through. What is the it they're trying to solve, which you really think you'd need to know to make a, a, a coherent quantitative comment about, for instance, whether nuclear power has got a big role or a small role to play? Um, but they haven't really thought that through. It's a very loose form of language by often scientists and engineers who are in quantitatively should know better. But then on the other side, you get policymakers say, oh, we'll be fine. As long as you put a high enough carbon tax on this, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get emissions down. You know, down by what amount? By when? Um, you know, what, what sort of level of tax will it have to be? Will there be regressive implications for equity? So people don't think the sort of systems through, the system implications through of these, these very sort of loose language that is used. And this language is used across 90% of the discussions on climate change. There's is no that, real is that, coherence. Is that loose language used just in the context of, say, the COP23, or is it <laughs> used in the context of when people are just having conversations about climate change, if they ever do? <laughs> is the loose talk uh, at a high level? or? I think, I think it's at, to be honest, I think it's at every level. Um, you know, everyone seems to be an expert on climate change, and they seem to be able to know what it is that we need to do about it. Um, and so far, of course, we've failed fundamentally, so I don't think we have any experts on climate change from that point of view. But I do expect some, at least, uh, within sort of uh, people that think about these issues, so within COP, but within universities and, and within NGOs and within businesses, I do expect some coherent thinking. I don't expect them just to be eloquent. That's what you often find. A lot, particularly people who are well-educated, they somehow think that, that a good education and an eloquent use of language um, is adequate. Now, I expect there to be some intellect and some coherence in their arguments as well. But if you, say, if you say we're going to meet a one and a half degree target, or if, if we're not going to meet one and a half, it'll be two. Yeah. Um, is that an example of loose talk? Or is there well, it, some... I mean, the, 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 it seems to be very clear. This is what yeah. we're going to do. Yeah. But is it that we are not in a position to achieve that? It'll be probably heading for three or four degrees. Yeah. Um, mm. And what discussion... How do we have the discussion? I mean, I, I'm quite interested to know what is the difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees. What is the difference between well, one and a half degrees and two degrees? To whom? To you? or to uh, If you're, if you're well, living in Bangladesh, on the coastal strip of Bangladesh, you'll see a big difference between one and a half and two. I mean, if we're showing these Sweden, pictures not... of people living their ordinary lives. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're sitting around, and one and a half degrees to all these different people is going to mean different, different things. things. Yeah, I think for these people here, the food would be imported from a different country. But to some of the other people here, they probably won't have any food at all. So I think it will vary depending where you live at, at one and a half degrees centigrade. And at two degrees centigrade, more, more groups of people are impacted. And I think at two degrees centigrade, in actual fact, I think even the wealthy parts of the world who like to think they're going to be insulated from the impacts will no longer be insulated from the impacts. So we came up with this idea of two degrees as a kind of an arbitrary number, one and a half degrees. I mean, the, the, the models, the climate models tell us that at one and a half degrees, 
this is likely to happen, mm. and at two degrees, this is likely to happen. Well, the other day we were talking about probabilities. Yeah. I mean, what's the probability of the Greenland ice shelf melting if we, if A, B, and C? I mean, how do we how do we quantify these? Things? Well, I think the probabilities are a big issue here. I mean, probability and uncertainty are a real challenge. They're quite a challenge for the scientific community to get their head round. But I think for the general public, that can be incredibly difficult. It's slightly easier with Greenland because probably at one and a half to two degrees C, we've, we're going to wipe out most of Greenland, but not within our lifetimes, not unless there's some fairly major medical advances. But would commit to wiping out. We're, yeah, we're pretty much going to commit to wiping out most of Greenland, which is about seven metres of sea level rise. And it's nice that we can, that the science can tell us that. I mean, the science is not ambiguous about that seven metre sea level rise. It no. could be six and a half or seven and a half, yeah. but it's seven metres. But what it is ambiguous about is whether it's going to happen in the next... 70 years or 700 years. It, yeah, I, th it, I think most of us, would, most, most of the analysis suggests not in 70, but it's, it's in the, the uh, multiple century level, which some, to, to some extent makes us feel that's a long way away. Um, but actually, if you live in, you know, in, uh, in Uppsala now, in, the, in, in Sweden, or if I'm back in, the, in Manchester, you, you, you're living in cities that have histories and have, have a sort of uh, and buildings and structures and infrastructures that are, that are often centuries old. You know, our roads were built by the Romans in the UK, and we just put tarmac on top of them. We haven't really changed a lot of those things. So what feels like a long way, way away from our individual lives, from our societal point of view, of course, is, is really just tomorrow. So Cambridge is at an altitude of about 10 metres. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. you'll be a seaside resort. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Look, looking forward to the beach. I grew up in, a, in, a, in Melbourne where um, lots of beaches, but Melbourne's at about eight metres. <laughs> yeah, I think Melbourne would be really stark. Well, I think the temperature might be a bit of an effect in Melbourne as well. But so, I, I mean, this, this business about one and a half degrees, um, the technology that we kind of assume is going to be there to, to achieve one and a half degrees, I mean, OK, we've got all our wind turbines and our solar panels and, and perhaps nuclear power, if we're interested in that. But um, buried in the COP uh, discussions is this idea of sequestering carbon dioxide, mm. of, of somehow capturing carbon dioxide either from the air or, or by burning trees instead of coal and capturing the carbon dioxide yeah. and putting it underground. And is this loose talk that here we are in the COPs, here we are talking about achieving these targets, and yet... This technology, are we, are we really relying on this technology? What if that technology fails? I mean, is the technology something there that we can use or ought it to be an insurance policy that we haven't yet developed? Well, it's certainly not an insurance policy because you expect insurance policy to pay out if things go wrong. And we, there's no way that we have any any real grasp that this is going to pay out. So these negative emission technologies that we're talking about, which we assume are going to remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And remember, it's, it's not just a bit of carbon dioxide. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of billions of tonnes of carbon dioxide. And if that doesn't mean much to most people, we probably produce about you know, three, million, three billion tonnes rather of uh, municipal solid waste every year. We probably produce about three billion tonnes of steel or cement, that's, those sorts of numbers. And we're talking here about hundreds of billions of tonnes of, of carbon dioxide. We've got to capture and shove somewhere deep underground and store it there for a few thousand years. Actually, I researched that uh, last year, and I think globally we produce 15 billion tonnes of steel throughout the world in all countries to combine in oh, 2015. 15, 15, yeah. So it's, it's much larger numbers than anything else that we actually do. I was and doing, these technologies don't work at the moment. Yeah. So I was doing the sums just, just for myself and I figured that, okay, I go to Australia to, uh, you know, last year, a couple of years ago, my mum died. So of course I went to the funeral, took the whole family. But you think, right, well, there's about 10 tonnes worth of CO2 for yeah. the family to go to Australia. now. Should, should we not do this sort of travelling anymore? It's difficult decisions for ordinary people to make. There's a whole new business opportunity in virtual funerals there, I think. <laughs> That's but, um, yeah, I mean, these are difficult. Um, they're very difficult decisions. To, the, the personal ones, I find, are much more challenging than some of the other ones. So I have an uncle in Australia, and I will never see him again. Most of my family are dead, but my uncle's still alive, and I will never see him again. I have to mention that, that Kevin does not refuses to fly to the cops. He only takes overland or overwater uh, transportation. He walks the walk. Well, we, um, we, the bunch of us who came from Cambridge, we decided that actually it's not too difficult to come from Cambridge, no, Cambridge by train. Yeah, yeah. And um, it took us about six hours on the train. It was a really pleasant journey. Yeah. But the thing is, you can't take the train to New York. No, we get a ship there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I went to Iceland a few years ago and it took me four days by container ship. But the thing is, I won't go there very often. And when I went to China, it took me 11 days. 
But the, the point about that is, it's not, it's not whether the emissions of the train are better or worse than the plane. That sort of misses the point, really. The point is, if you go to China, and it takes you 11 days going there, firstly, you don't go there for a two-day meeting, as most of my colleagues did. They flew there, did two days, and then flew home. You go and you think, well, I'm going to have to spend some time here, because I'm not going to come back again for a long time, not if it takes so far. So it changes your whole ethos towards time. So I went and did a three-week lecture tour, and it took me 11 days there, 11 days back, which you have to plan and so forth. And when I went to Iceland, it's the same thing. The World Bank people that were going there for the meeting just flew in and flew out. It's because I'd spent four days in the ship in the middle of the North to Atlantic in the winter. I guess, no, to um, say nothing of the COP, where we bring twenty-five to 40,000 people, yeah. mostly 99% come by, by airplane to, yeah. to try to figure out how we're going to stop yeah. but producing carbon. We must just pick on the, I mean, the aviation there, because I mean, aviation is, is, is very important, but I just see it's much more emblematic about where our site is going. So most people that fly, because remember, most people do not fly, but most people fly, certainly the academics, spend a lot of time in taxis getting to and from airports. I often see this with academics. They come to even a train station, they wouldn't ever dream of looking for a bus or a tram. Mm. They'll go straight into a taxi. So, it, so that sort of mindset embeds a lot of other things about status in life. They will live in large houses in the more exotic parts of town. They'll eat large amounts of food and it's kept in their huge double door refrigerators. So it's, this, this, the aviation is just emblematic of that sort of level of consumption. So, so there's my, a, my, there, my carbon footprint then, going to Australia, that's the bit that I thought was, was big. But then I thought, well, how, what do I compare it with? Because we're not very good with numbers, these billions and trillions yeah, yeah. and zillions. Um, but I reckon that my carbon footprint is probably maybe 20 tonnes of CO2 a year. Let's take a guess, I don't know. So I figured out, how much CO2 a year do I produce just by breathing? And that turns out to be about 200 kilograms. And then I worked out, how much poo do I produce when I you know, go to the toilet? How much poo do I produce? I don't know why I wanted to figure this out. Hmm. So I did a back of the envelopes calculation, and that comes out to be about... 300 kilograms or something. And then I thought, how much kitchen waste, you know, which, you know the stuff that you put in the bin, mm. do we produce as our family? And that turns out to be 500 kilograms a year. So the sum total of all my excrement and breathing and just stuff you do when you're living without fossil fuels is only a, a ton a year. And yet I'm doing 20 tons yeah, of carbon dioxide, yeah. of fossil, on fossil fuels. It puts it into perspective. It's not as if it's a small change. It's a huge change. I, I think this is where we've got some big issues here, actually, because we always look for historical parallels, and people use the ozone layer or, or acid rain, and we don't have any historical parallels for dealing with climate change mm. and the use of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are everywhere. They're in the, in the dyes that are in our clothes. They're in how we actually travel to the COP. They're in the lights that keep, that are keeping us lit out, that keeping the screens going here. They're actually the, probably the material that made the formica on top of these tables. So virtually every facet of our life now is wrapped up in the hydrocarbon industry. And the idea, the idea of trying to transition away from that in just a handful of years is we just, have, we just do not have pre precedence for this. And therefore, I think we have to be very careful about saying, well, we've done this before. We haven't done this before. This is a blank sheet of paper, which in some ways is quite exciting. Um, and the trick is, can we find other things about, as we make this, this essential transition away from fossil fuels, can it also deliver other good things in society at the same time? So I get back to the idea of, of technology, that you know, the, 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 this kind of loose talk of technology, that our oh, technology will solve yeah. It'll fix everything. I mean, you hear it all the time that yeah. um, there's going to be something that'll fix it. But there are some technologies that already exist that we can really just use a lot more of and be a lot more willing to accept um, to change our consumption. Um, I mean, we can change our lifestyles a lot, can't we? Just today. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the thing I often go on about is if in the, in the short to medium term, which is where we have to make some dramatic changes, the first thing we can do almost immediately are change, is change our behaviour. But I don't want to put the focus just on the individual. The individual is important there, and but their emissions themselves are... Yeah, it's, it'd be great if their emissions came down, but actually what's important about the individual is they catalyse change. They catalyse change within their family, within their institution, within their sports club, within their university, and then that can, actually, that, that can be then um, sort of scaled up by other people, by policymakers or by local councils or by you know, company leaders and so forth. But individuals have a role in trying to demonstrate what is it we can actually do. But on so, top of that, technology is important as well, the demand see, side if, technology. So if young people who are going to be around long time longer than you and you and I'll be around. Um, young people are going to embrace these new technologies and new lifestyles, or are they going to be like us, you know, reluctant to give up our 
our luxuries. Well, we always embrace new lifestyles. I mean, my, my lifestyle is quite a lot different from my parents. My parents is very different from their parents. So new lifestyles are something certainly, certainly post-enlightenment, certainly post-industrial revolution. They're things that seem to occur all the time. But whether, of course, these would be lower carbon lifestyles is a different matter. And even if they were lower carbon lifestyles, it's not, it's not enough just for the young generation to be doing that. What they've got to be doing is actually imposing lower carbon lifestyles if, the, if their families and parents won't do it willingly, imposing it on the, on the, the generation above them. In other words, us. You know, we have failed. And I think there is something about handing the baton of leadership onto the next generation. I mean, not that we have to give up, give up then, but actually they should be telling us what we should do. We have tried our leadership and it has fundamentally failed on climate change. And I think perhaps the younger generation, they're not locked up into all the baggage that we have. They see the world differently. They may choose to fail as well. But at least let's give them a choice. We've had our chance and we've, we've blown it. But they've, they're also, the younger generation is prone to a very, very strong influence from our generation mm. in the form of advertising. They're being indoctrinated with the consumptive lifestyle to start with. In, in they are, but I, was, I mean, it's very easy again for us, us old sort of um, technology Luddites in terms of modern IT anyway, to sort of dismiss all the social media. But we don't know where the social media is going to take us. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting with how, how Sanders used it or in the UK, how Corbyn used it. You know, Corbyn had the, 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 the greatest sort of campaign ever um, set in place by any, any set of media to undermine him in the elections. And yet the social media, actually played out. That was what made the weather, not the, not the main media. So there's actually, perhaps there's actually scope now for more sort of peer-to-peer -peer advertising, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Is that occurring already? I'm not saying this is going to be the case. Maybe it's not necessarily a good thing. But I think things are different from how we saw the world. Things have changed. The way people communicate is different. You also you already see quite a few, a few in the younger generation and are less enamored with necessarily having a big car and a big house, probably because they can't even afford to get those things now. But what they um, can have are experiences. Now, at the moment, those experiences tend to be you know, fueled by fossil fuels flying somewhere. But that they're seeing something else in, in their own value system, different to the idea I've got a big house and a big car in my driveway. That's not necessarily the thing that, that differentiates them from the other people that they want to be differentiated from. There's something different going on. It may not be low carbon, but, but it maybe it could be. Now, I expect a lot more dire forecasts from you. I'm hearing optimism. That, that, that's wonderful, but do we have the, the time to see these transitions? I, I hear 2020 is a... Uh, yeah. uh, well, there is, there is optimism. And one of the things that um, I've found, that we've been organising this um, Cambridge Climate Lecture Series, which starts again in February next year. And Kevin, you spoke at our Cambridge Climate Lecture Series in this year. Yeah. Um, and um, what is really interesting is that we're engaging lots and lots of young people uh, the, the, the young, young people interested in climate change. And they're not going to come to the lectures physically. They're going to tune in um, mm. through social media, through live streaming, through the internet. And I watch my own kids. Well, they don't watch television. They don't read newspapers. They're doing everything on the, on the social media. So the messages are getting through by ways that you and I, we didn't grow up with those, no, with those, no. with those media. So the optimism, I think, is... Uh, that uh, com communicating these messages, you're right. I mean, that the Jeremy Corbyn in the, the, the UK election recently got a message through by social media that was impossible to, to do by other means. Mm. So I, I do think there's optimism. I mean, yeah. you, have to, you have to say there is optimism. Well, I wouldn't work in this area if I didn't think there was a chance. And if I, was, if I sort of nailed my colours to the mast, I think there's a 95% chance we'll go to hell in the handcart. We'll go to four degrees C or something like that. But there's a 5% chance we could succeed. And that 5% chance isn't random. That 5% chance is actually a choice. So we can choose to fail or we can choose to succeed. And I work in this area because I think we can still choose to succeed. So the thought, sorts of things I'm talking about here are the sorts of things that might help us move in the right direction. Now, of course, the signs are not looking particularly good. We've got a whole established power structures. With a, with, we like the status quo. The senior people like the positions they're already in. They like their comfortable lifestyles. We've got the hydrocarbon industry, which is incredibly powerful and undermines everything it possibly can to bring, out, bring about its demise. Um, and we've got generally relatively weak politicians in terms of responding to some of these challenges. So things are not looking particularly good, but I still can see, I can see a way out of the problem, out of the chaos that we're actually um, in and heading towards even more. And whilst you can see that, then it's worth working on it. So there's a, there's a te technical fix. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? <laughs>
<laughs> you say it. There is a technical fix which is kind of on the cards, and that's this thing called geoengineering. And it what's really, that then, Hugh? What's that then, Hugh? It really is a scary concept that if we fail to meet our CO2 emissions targets and temperatures rise, there will be a temptation to try and modify the climate by, say, spraying aerosols into the stratosphere to reflect sunlight. Now, just last week in, uh, in Washington, D.C., there was a meeting um, held uh, on behalf of Congress to uh, discuss geoengineering. Now, if you held a meeting about geoengineering in Sweden or in France or something, you wouldn't think too much about it. But it's slightly worrying if that meeting is happening in Washington. <laughs> um, does that mean that somebody you know, who's got quite a lot of power might just write a check and say, well, let's do this geoengineering. Now, to me, that's a real worry. Um, and so, it's again, it's more loose talk on, on technology. It, it is loose talk on technology. And, but I think, again, I don't want to dismiss technology. As an engineer, I used to design and build offshore oil platforms. I think engineering can do a lot. That's not always the good things in my case, but anyway. Um, but so I think that we have to look at these sort of engineering opportunities. And you might, if we are going to try them out, you need, they need to meet a set of criteria that may be sustainability criteria and equity criteria and so forth. So, I mean, I, th I would think at the moment, the idea of even testing, putting sulfate significantly into the stratosphere probably is, is, it should be a long way off. We need a lot more work as to whether that's something, whether there be other sets of consequences. But perhaps if you change the slight um, breeding patterns, or the, uh, sorry, the... Um, the variety, some of the plants that we grew, some of the agricultural plants that we grew, so they had leaves that were slightly more reflective. So reflecting. Yeah. Some. Now, is that something we should we should be trying? Now, that might affect the amount of vitamin A in the plant or something like that. I don't know. But we can start to we can start to say, well, what are the other sets of criteria? And um, we can reflect the sunlight by um, by vaporising seawater. Um, and causing more clouds. Now, that may have some negative implications, but we'd probably do smaller tests on that that would be less sustainability damaging, if it went wrong, than putting sulfates in the stratosphere. So I think we need to look at these things, you know, technology by technology, assess them against a set of criteria, and say, should we be testing these, actually empirically testing them, as well as they're testing them on our computers? Yes, 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 we should be testing these, and we should be setting up rules for governance. But are we doing it? There's well, a lot of discussion in the whole field. I mean, there are lots of engineers. Loose talk. Um, well, no, I think to start off with, you've got to even identify what do these things look like. And I still think quite a lot of the time we're, just, we're still sketching out exactly what the details are of these things. So I, do, I, I think the engineers are doing what they appropriately should be doing at the moment. But also there is discussion going on amongst in the academic realm and maybe beyond that now about what would the governance stru structures look like for this. But then you also have to think about well, what happens, you know, the political psychology of this is what happens if these things are available and that, that actually undermines what we feel is our need for mitigation. And mm. I think we already see that. We see that just with the negative emission technologies. That, that has already undermined some of the legislation in the UK and the new climate law in Sweden because they assume these things are going to work in the future. You assume so, they're going to work, but they just the technologies that don't exist. Yeah. And I guess we yeah. ought to be having these discussions. And so we've got to encourage you know, the people in this room to be willing to go out and talk about some pretty scary things. Yes, but I also think the people here, they've got lives to lead. And you know, some of these may be you know, teachers or plumbers or police women or whatever they might be. And you know, they've got their jobs to do. And we, we, you know, they, they feed into our system. And they're employing us to go off and do our careful, diligent work on climate change or geoengineering, or policymakers, they're employing them to do their careful work as policymakers. My concern is we're, those of us in the, these positions at the moment are actually not doing our jobs properly. You know, they're, they're paying us, and we're not doing our jobs mm. properly. We're not being coherent in our, in our own environment. And so I think it's like, it's like employing a plumber who makes a complete mess of your boiler and your radiator. That's not a good plumber. And they're employing us, and we're making a complete mess of what we're looking at. We're not coherent. We haven't thought these things through. Um, so it's not that they all should get involved. They should be really expecting us to do our jobs properly. And I think we have mm. fairly well failed so far to do our jobs coherently. We've all got our little pet technologies or pet policies that we think are going to solve the problems. But actually, when we stand back, stand back from that, that's simply uh, loose talk. Yeah. How do we fix it? Well, let's open up the questions and see what the audience says. <laughs> Michael Wiley, uh, Homo Sapiens Foundation, and a physicist and a communicator. Speaking for physics here, um, fossil fuels are really a subset of natural resources. If we all live like Kevin, 
and like me and like you, all of, all of us right here, we're going to crash the planet just with biology extractions, metal extractions, and mineral extractions to make your trains and mm. uh, your boats and so forth. The problem, it seems, to the resource scientists is our living standard by ours, the very high developed, Europe, America, mm. and so forth. And we're ignoring that problem. We're doing small little fixes like reusable shopping bags and like the illusion uh, the, the, the one that kills me is that resource efficiency is now going down. It's descending at 0.8% per year in terms of the resources that are necessary to make products. And, so we're uh, not getting more efficient, we're getting less efficient. We're getting less efficient, and worldwide, the resources that actually go in that are truly recycled are 0.6%. Now, we're not making any headway on the big subject, so I think we should generalize from fossil fuels, imagine that we eliminate all of them, now what do we do about biology, about metals, which are required to make wind turbines and, and solar collectors? Well, and it solar. is right. If we, now if we, what do we do about construction when the average skyscraper that's going up is going to last 25 years? So we want to be thinking about imagining a future in a couple of hundred years' time, and think about how do we get from where we are now to there. And where we are now to there is really quite a tricky journey. Mm. I don't know whether you've got a, a sort of a roadmap, but, it's, but it kind of says we can't, there's all sorts of things about can't, we can't continue to be mm. doing. I'm not sure it's that long time frame. Um, I, I actually think no, we, we need it's that. It's 2100. We crash at 2100. Yeah, but, yeah, I'll send I, you the details. I actually think we, if, even if we can provide something with a bit more detail between, say, now and 2050. Um, and then, yeah, we, we need to be, we think about further away as well, but we can say more about that period of time. And then other people obviously coming in with their own views um, as, you know, the, as the younger generations mature. I, we, I mean, we, have, we, we can resolve quite a lot of these issues. I mean, I, 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 I don't want to overplay the idea of the circular economy. I think there's a lot in engineering that can help us understand how we can actually reuse some of the materials, not just the materials, but actually the commodities that we've made out of them. So you're not just looking to recycle, you're actually looking to reuse some of the parts of the commodities. So modular construction, so you don't buy a new fridge, you just use the same chassis. And what you might change is the compressor. So you start to look at other ways you design and build things that at least it won't eliminate these problems, but I think you can actually reduce some of the levels of resource flow to our society. But at the moment, we basically use once, throw it away. We only have less than a minute left, yep. and in deference to those who come in the next press conference, I don't want to run over at all. So please, I know you'll have questions for these gentlemen. You can just send them to me at my email address, um, which is here again. Thank you very much for joining us today, and see you tomorrow. Thank you.